Hello, and welcome to Creepy Core and Folklore, the show about creatures, encounters, old tales, and myths. I'm your host, Iona Wayland, a dark fantasy author, mental health professional, and overall curious person. I want to join other spooky souls and hear about these unusual stories. Hello, spooky soul, and welcome to this very special Creepy Core and Folklore episode. Um, We're a little early, um, but I wanted to celebrate Mermaid with you. Um, And in case you didn't know, every 10th episode, 9th when it came to the werewolf episode, but every 10th episode, I do an extra special deep dive into a topic and one of the most asked for topics since starting creepy core and folklore has been about mermaids and mermaid adjacent information and like those sea dwelling humanoid creatures and so i've been super excited the thing is is that just like just like what happens when you meet a mermaid Um, I began drowning in the information and I went full throttle deep dive into all things mermaid. I learned things I have never heard about before. I learned things I knew but was more even more enlightened on. And I, as the information kept getting recorded and the script kept getting written for this episode and I was making my notes... I realized that this is going to be the longest special episode yet. Um, I also learned that in the near future, I, <laughs> I'm going to save special episodes to be like once every couple months instead of like every 10 episodes. But what I'm going to do is if actually when this episode gets to a certain length, I'm going to say maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half, I think is my longest episode out there. Um, I'm just going to cut it off and do parts two or three if it comes to that, you know. And honestly, I think that'll end up working out because we're celebrating mermaid together. We're mermaid mermaiding together. And uh, kudos to Tom Bancroft who actually made up the term mermaid. He's a um, illustrator. Um, and so he started the mermaid challenge, I think back in like 2016 or something. Um, but I looked at him and he actually made Mushu. Like he was part of concept artist for Mushu from Mulan, which is, she's my favorite Disney princess, but that's a whole other topic that I'm trying to make my ADHD brain not go down (laughs) because I already have so much information to get into now. Um, but you know, I know this is a little early because this is still late April, but I wanted to use the special 40th episode to celebrate our fishy friends. So I was saving this um, special episode to as close as May as possible. And that just so happens, you know, to be this one and maybe consecutive one since I'm pretty positive this is going to end up being the a whale. Oh my gosh, I'm going to just keep making puns. Please don't leave. Please listen to all the research I did about mermaids. I beg you, (laughs) please don't let this be in vain. Um, I'll stop making puns if you stay, please. For the most part, I'll stop making puns. Um, But there was just, just, just gorgeous. Like all these gorgeous stories and there's such a rich history and the symbolism. Oh my gosh, I can't wait to get into it with you. So our undersea friends have been like I said, the most requested topic since the beginning of CCFL. And I'm excited to deep dive this time, pun intended, pun intended, just this last one. Um, So grab some goggles, take a deep breath, and we're going to plunge into the dark world of mermaids. Before we get too far into things, we need to take a look at all the different types of merfolk there are and anything adjacent. 
So lots of these are easily confused and there's a ton of overlap when there are retellings of them as their tales traveled across the globe. So we're going to go through each of these concepts and I know I'm not going to get everything, but first I'm going to go over the concepts, then I'm going to get into the lore, and then I'm going to talk about kind of the conclusion and the symbolism of all these different tellings and all these different depictions. That also might just so happen to be how I break up this special episode. (laughs) So first off, we start strong. It was with something I had never heard of before. They're called Marrows. Um, It's an Irish legend, but I also think it's more Celtic legend too, because I saw some stuff about Scottish lore about marrows, but it's said to occur around any freshwater. So these marrows live there. They have long green hair and they wear a noticeable red cap. I also personally thought this was like a fun way to think about like red green combos of anything other than like freaking December that like takes over red and green. And I love seeing the red and green combo. And this is, I'm just going to always think of marrows now. So if their cap is, quote, lost, they'll become a human. I'm honestly unsure of what that means actually. Uh, Does it mean lost, stolen? Does it mean coming off of their head? Like, what does that mean? Um, I have a feeling that it's along the, like, I stole it and made you my bride kind of situation because that happens a lot, I notice, in this type of folklore, which we will definitely get into. So get ready to notice a pattern. (laughs) Um, But apparently, you know, if it's stolen, they turn into a human form. Um, And I'm even more so thinking that's the case that it's more like held there. It's like a hostage situation because the author of this particular article talking about Marrow's Um, by Adonaya Damilola talks about how when they find their red cap, they'll return to the waters. Sometimes, like the quote was, quote, sometimes abandoning entire families in the process, end quote. And I'm sorry, but also not sorry. I will be on the side of the fleeing entity, like of the fleeing creature that was held there against their will or coerced there. I will always be on their side. (laughs) Run back to the freshwater marrow. Go, go, get out of there. So next up, we have sirens. Uh, They're from Greek mythology. Um, They are, they were considered Persephone's servants. Some things I saw said that they were Persephone's, they were Persephone's like confidants or like, I don't know like posse. Um, But a lot of most of it I saw was that they were her servants. And even though it's going to be more lore and story heavy later on, um, not so much in this section, I did want to point out some of the lore here so you could understand what was going on with the making of sirens. So Persephone, of course, has her own big story. um, And just for, you know, understanding sake her mom is Demeter and Demeter is the goddess of agriculture so Persephone was also originally an agriculturally based entity or deity like her mom um, but she was specific to grains and vegetation and she was also considered the goddess of spring hey look how it all ties together Um, then there's a whole story of how she was tricked or lured or talked into I don't know into being the goddess of the underworld Um, And so when Persephone was gone, like she was in the underworld, she could not be found. Her mother Demeter sent all of the sirens out to find her daughter. And it was said that they went around calling her name and singing for her to find her. Um, They're considered to be wicked and they're still said to be calling to this very day. Their call is what's noticeable in pretty much every single telling of a siren. And it's said to be what lures ships and humans to their death. That's why, like, there's that siren song uh, that is attributed to the sirens. Another story, um, the Odyssey, you know, a little story called the Odyssey, (laughs) um, talks about them. Uh, And it describes them that it kind of took some creative liberties. Like, I mean, that's no shade to the Odyssey of all things. I like when stories take creative liberties 
for the most part. Um, but in the Odyssey specifically, sirens are seen as the daughters of the river god Achilles and Muse. Um, and they're supposed to lure people to their deaths. But if they pass them, if like the person passes them unscathed, the sirens were supposed to drown themselves. So it doesn't seem like they, they have like more of a humanoid form. Um, and we'll get more into what they look like and why in a second. But in the Odyssey, it's said that they live on a rocky island called Sirenum Scopuli. Um, by, and it was called that by the Romans. Um, and it was said that there would be these beautiful women there and there were corpses that were rotting away and bones surrounding them by the ones that they had killed. Their appearance is often shifting. So from what I'm reading, they appear as either beautiful, quote, maidens, end quote, that look completely human, but that morphed into those, quote, bird women, end quote. Um, And that's the thing where it's like some of the ones I uh, now that I'm Googling it, they'll have like the face of a beautiful woman, but the body of a bird. Um, And there's two reasons for the bird imagery. One uh, is my personal lesser favorite story where like Demeter turned the sirens who were originally maidens into bird like creatures as a punishment for failing to protect her daughter. The second possibility that I saw to this story and how they became bird-like was that the sirens asked Demeter for wings like her because Demeter has wings um, so that they can help search for Persephone better and cover more ground. I think this shows like friendship and support and things like that. Um, And it makes sense to that, like, even if they were servants or maybe they were more of like a posse type of ladies they wanted to look for Persephone and they missed her so I personally like that story or that telling a bit better sirens show up in countless stories and their tales will change sometimes but I personally like to think of them as these horrifying bird creatures that are willing to go to the ends of the earth for their friend or goddess next up we have some open ocean mermaids so there are apparently tons of subspecies from uh, current sand, shallow, murky, clear, and deep trenches of the ocean. So there will be all these different subsets of like apparently how evolution caused them to change in different uh, types of oceans. The open ocean is very vague and broad. Um, They're said to be in pods of 30 to 50. They're supposedly like blue, green, or light purple tails that help them blend in. And they're said to have counter shading. So I didn't know what counter shading was, um, but it's interesting and it makes sense now that I know. So counter shading basically means that they have a darker backside to hide, like as they swim, uh, like imagine them suspended. So they have a darker backside so that they can hide from predators that are swimming above them and looking down. So they kind of match the deeper water color. And then they are said to be lighter or brighter from the front side to hide from the predators that are looking up. So think of predators that are like looking up towards the surface. That's where the light source is. And so they're going to be lighter or brighter. And the first thing that popped to my mind of this kind of counter shading coloration were stingrays. So if you just imagine a stingray, how they have those tan tummies and that kind of like darker gray or darker tan uh, backs. It's said that open ocean mermaids vary in temperament and personality, um, but that they speak like an ancient undersea language. I kind of like to imagine them using like echolocation or like whale or dolphin speak, which I think is just so fascinating to me. So I kind of like imagining these mermaids like screeching at each other. I bet you it sounds beautiful. It probably doesn't sound like a screech. These open ocean mermaids are also considered, quote, traveler mermaids, end quote. And I believe it's because people uh, say that these open ocean mermaids will travel Um, a great distance and there's more sightings of them because we're talking about any expanse of open ocean and so travelers will spot them more easily too. Next up we have freshwater mermaids. These are mermaids that live in lakes, ponds, streams, rivers. 
they usually have complex civilizations. They're in pods of, it said pods of 30 to 50, but also later on in this article, it talked about how depending on the space that they have to work with, like if it's a little pond, it might be like one or two, but if it's a huge lake, like a great lake, then there could be 50 of them. These are said to be friendlier and that they have a green color to their skin. I made a sea or mermaid creature in my book, um, All Green. But looking at this, I wonder if maybe I need to switch her up, like switch up her coloration because if I even include her, honestly, but because she's from the sea. So I don't know. Anyway, the size of the body of water determines how large the pod gets um, and then also how muddy or clear the water is will determine if the, the mermaid has any counter shading. If it's really clear water, as you can imagine, they would need counter shading because the predators would be able to see. If it's murky water or murky depths then or cloudy depths, um, they would not need the counter shading because they could blend in with like the opaqueness of the water. I love some good evolutionary lore. These freshwater mermaids can be carnivores, herbivores, or omnivores, just depending. And in case you didn't know, omnivore just means both, but I don't mean to like insult your intelligence either. Like they, they'll eat meat and veg- vegetation. Next up, we have naiads. I, the way this this article spells Nayad is N-A-I-D-E-S, which is a Turkish name. Um, and then I'm used to seeing Nayad as N-A-I-A-D-S um, from like lore, but I could be completely wrong. And if I, I, I could be saying this wrong, but it looks like either way it would be Nayads. But um, I have heard of these, but I didn't know what they were. I, I kind of had a faint idea of it, but this it was cool to learn more about them. So they're freshwater. They sound a bit more interesting to me than the freshwater mermaids. Um, they live in rivers, springs, wells, and fountains. It makes me think of like urban fantasy. Like, can you imagine going to make like a wish in a big fountain and realizing there's a naiad in there? <laughs> Where you're like, oh, hello. Or like, oh my gosh. Also living rurally, rurally, I can speak. Um, We have well water. And having a creature come out of the well. I have goosebumps right now. Just imagining it. Um, And there's a story later talking about something coming out of a well. I don't like it. Um, And then also being around springs can be a little spooky. The, especially the ones with the spring houses where you're like, oh, wow, look at this tiny house. Look at this little door and you open it up and it's just like burbling water. It makes me really uncomfortable. Like I need, I, <laughs> but naiads are said to live there. And I had never heard of like a mermaid-esque creature living in a spring or a well before. Um, and I think that's very cool and horrifying. So they're said to protect certain humans that are kind of like within their scope, depending on if they like them, basically, and their waterways, whatever that means for them. So you're supposed to make offerings to the naiad, um, and they will in turn like bless the waters that they're taking care of. Um, You can absorb some of their power or powers. It didn't go into depth about what the powers were, just more so like if you swim in that protective protected waterway um, or water area, you'll get certain things like depending, maybe it depends on the naiad that, that protects it, but you can get anything from like curing illnesses, um, inspiration for your writing, whether it's poetry, they talk about poets a lot, but also like uh, any kind of writing. It can bring fertility to someone who's struggling with it, specifically those who plan on carrying the baby. Um, I thought this was really interesting because that is another, I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's another symbol that pops up a lot in many of these stories. And also it's said that if you use that water, not just swim in it, but like if you use it to water your crops, you'll have more fertile crops and like a bigger reaping at harvest. They're known for their beauty, long flowing hair, and they're often seen naked. 
Um, because of their nudity, which this is very interesting to me, it'll cause anywhere from humans to gods to fall in love with them. And I think that the usage of love is very interesting because with a lot of these tellings, it'll talk about like holding someone hostage or coercing someone or tricking them into marriage or producing offspring or staying on land or whatever. And it'll call it love. And I think it's lust or obsession from one party and being targeted when it comes to the merfolk. Anyway, getting off my soapbox for a second. They can cause floods, droughts, and if they're upset with who's using their water, they can make it undrinkable and poisonous or toxic. Their strength comes from their body of water specifically, and if it's polluted, it will negatively impact them and they can even die from that. Next up, we have kiosk or kiosk. Um, if I say kiosk, it reminds me of like 2000s malls. <laughs> so I'm, I think I'm going to call them kiosks. Um, but this kind of roughly translates to Maid of the Waves um, in Celtic lore. So they have salmon tail-like bottom halves. Wait, I think I've seen this before. Where it's just like the head of a woman or a femme being, and then the rest is like a pink fish. Never mind, I was mistaken. It looks like top half human, bottom half salmon fish. I don't know where I got the other image of just like that woman head and then like a tail coming right off of her head. Anyway, um, it can be harmful or unlucky to be around them, but if you catch it, you'll get three wishes. If the kidnapped sea sig or sea sig, oh my gosh, that's like I'm trying to say seasick. Sorry, it's spelled C E A S G. So that's <laughs> just making up words. Kiosk and sailors discover true love. She will change into a human and walk on land, bestowing good fortune on the spouse for the rest of their life. I'm still a bit unsettled by the whole Stockholm Syndrome thing, but whatever. Um, it seems a bit symbolic of the like water women or fishermen um, just kind of like being asked to live like like a quote normal citizen or like more traditional lifestyle instead of being out on the sea. So I could see maybe some symbolism there, especially in Celtic areas like especially in Celtic lore where a lot of the seafaring people would get their jobs there, but it was like also harsh working environments and conditions. It still is. Um, and so it's not for the faint of heart and wanting to like call that person back to land. There's a Scottish telling specifically where there's this like, if you have a human and mermaid coupling that it creates the kiosk, and sometimes the kiosk is said to encase their soul in an item so that they can live forever. So they'll encase their soul in like a seashell or a locket or um, a rock of some sort so that they can live forever if no one finds that and harms where they keep their soul. Next up, we have an oceanid. This is a this is a water nymph in the deepest of the ocean's depths. As someone who is horrified from the ocean, especially deep waters, I'm imagining like the faceless fish or an angler fish type of like trench worm type oceanid. I'm so uncomfortable. Like any deep sea creature looks like something out of like a concept for a horror movie. And if oceanids are only in the deepest parts of the trenches, I would imagine they would be like that. A little less human, a little more, a little more. Not not settling for me to look at. <laughs> Even more horrifyingly, oceanids outnumber all other mermaid species. Um Amphitrite and Doris are two noted oceanid demigods. Um, they will guard deep waters and act as gods 
spouses like gods as in like maybe one god but maybe multiple god spouses um and lovers and they will protect the offspring that they create um and some oceanids even grow up to be gods or deities themselves sailors boaters etc devote prayers and sacrifices to oceanids to avoid a terrible storm or be protected if they were to somehow topple into the water at any second I'm I'm still searching this article. It does not say what they look like. Um, I tried to Google it, um, and I get all sorts of artwork. Um, it really varies, so I can't get a good look at them. But I'm going to keep, and I'm going to keep on imagining like the worst sea creatures ever. <laughs> um, <laughs> just because that is interesting yet terrifying to me. Also, I see from my quick Google search, like on Wikipedia, it said that Oceanids are three the 3,000 plus daughters of Titans, Oceanus and Tethrys. Um, or maybe it's Tetris. Actually, I do. I think that's Tetris. So there's some Wikipedia information tossed in there. Next up, we have Selkies. They are seen on the British Isles and Iceland. They aren't cold-blooded, they're warm-blooded, meaning, and again, not to insult your intelligence at all, but basically less fishy, more mammal, more mammalian. Um, So these are like shape-shifting women uh, from like a seal-like creature. Um, I think they look like seals, but they, I guess technically they aren't. So a seal-like creature to a human person who can walk on land. Um, When they shed that seal skin, they become human and they can take it on and off at will. This reminds me of the Awu werewolf episode. I feel so stupid saying that. <laughs> the last special episode, um, it's titled Awu werewolf, um, but where people would pull on like the wolf skin and become a wolf or, or that were creature. And I thought that would and shapeshift into that. And I think that's very interesting because that's what's happening with the Selkies, except for this time it's specific to seals. But when they put, yeah, when they put that skin back on or that hide back on, they become a seal again. So often tales of their seal skin being held hostage um, and feeling compelled to marry and or produce children for their captor. It's like honestly really sad. Even though these are told as these like great love stories, I get really sad looking at it because that sounds tragic to me. Also something that like maybe I'm reading into it a bit much, but it seemed like when the seal skin was taken that they were more like malleable or easily suggestible. And that they kind of like, they never forgot where they came from, but you can like suggest for them to do things like stay on land and they would want to stay on land. Whereas if they were their true self, they and had possession of their hide, even if they're not wearing their hide, if they had possession of their hide, they seem to not be as suggestible like they were their true self. So that makes me even more uncomfortable if that is the case and if I'm interpreting this correctly. So they would often run back to the sea without, quote, without a second thought uh, once they did find their skin or if their children was like, what's this, mom? And it was like their seal skin. And again, with the symbolism, it's that awful, like, quote, I'll domesticate you and quote, disgusting femme conquest thing going on in these stories. Also, FYI, I have a brief, as of right now, I have a brief mention of a Selkie in my sequel, and I think they're cute. Next up, we have Hai Ho Shang. Um, This entity will drag entire boats underwater and drown the entire crew. Um, And it's a masculine looking thing. So to repel him, you're supposed to burn feathers on deck. However, if he still keeps approaching, there's this intricate dance to the beat of like a ritual gong that you have to do to try and ward him off. This is the first like mask or masculine depiction that I have seen um, from these tellings. They have the body of a large fish and a head of a Buddhist priest. Hey, there's the head in the fish body. See, I don't make shit up all the time. Um, And I think that's interesting that the way that 
Hai Ho Shang is depicted. Very interesting. Next up, we have the Kappa. Listen to these funny things. So these are considered Japanese tricksters and healers, just depending. Um, they have they are these like humanoid green creatures. They're often like seen as like childlike or child sized. Um, they have webbed hands and feet with a turtle shell on their back, um, and they're considered a water spirit. So there's a depression in their head that retains water. And if this like head bowl of water runs out, then they become extremely weak. And some I think even will die. But I think for the most part, it just like severely weakens them. If this head depression of water spills, Um, they're said to like be silly and like wrestle humans, but sometimes (laughs) they'll accident. Sorry, this isn't funny. (laughs) Sometimes kappas will accidentally wrestle humans to death because they're like joking and playing with them in the water. (laughs) Um, so they accidentally drown them. I mean, I hope it's an accident. I don't know. I don't know for sure. They're also said to love to eat cucumbers specifically. (laughs) And I'm just like, hey, little fella what are you doing? (laughs) You're accidentally murdering people and just chomping on some cucumbers with your head bowl. Don't spill your head bowl. (laughs) I'm sorry. These are just so awkward looking. Like, honestly, look up a picture of them. (laughs) They're so like endearing um, in like a creepy, turtly, like swamp thing, like lake creature kind of way. I don't know. They'll sometimes, this is, I don't even know what this is. They'll sometimes steal a magical organ in a person's anus. And I don't know what that is, but I'm fighting the urge to make inappropriate ass jokes. <laughs> um, but yeah, check out pictures of them. They're so funny looking, yet so like kind of cute, um, despite them being turn burglars. So we've got, next up we have Nagini and Naga or Nega. Um, They appear in religious stories, specifically in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism, and they show up in South and East Asia. So some are divine and others are semi-divine. They live in the underworld. They're half human, half snake, or sometimes they're depicted as a human carrying many, many snakes. Some live in water and some live on land, but I'm still including them anyway. Um, And they're seen as benevolent protectors of treasure. So I think that's cool. Like if you see a Nagini or a Naga or Nega, um, then you can expect to see treasure. And they're not like rude. They're just like these benevolent protectors. Next up, we have Ipapiara. These are sea creatures in Brazil during the 16th century. Um, They have seal heads, human bodies, and fish tails. Um, I don't like that mashup but then i'm also intrigued by that max that mashup at the same time not only are they like visually peculiar but they're also really scary they'll attack people and eat parts of their body there's something about like it's like oh i like to kill and eat people and it's like wow that's horrifying i'm scared of you and then there's something like wow i like to kill and eat people uh, specifically they're like calves or thighs. It's like, okay. Um, that makes me a bit more unsettled. I don't know. I especially like their forearms. It's like, please go away. <laughs> you seal headed, human bodied, fish tailed thing. Like, don't, don't come near me. They'll also even sometimes kill people by hugging them. I don't know what that means. I don't know if they like will be like, bring it in, buddy. And then they hug them and then they like crush them. Or if they mean that like the writer of this article meant that like they like like a boa constrictor where they'll like constrict them. I don't know. That grosses me out. Next up, we have the Ojibwa mermaids. These are stories from the indigenous American mermaids, specifically within Canada. Um, or like the Ojibwe tribe, but also there's other tribes that have similar mermaids like this. Um, Usually these mermaids and humans were aware of each other, but they tried not to cross paths. Um, Often the humans 
who did had like awful stories that happened to them like killed or worse um and though there are even some brief mentions of love stories it's still a tragic ending for the human this article written by margaret kingsbury suggests the story collection it's titled mermaids and medicine women by basil johnston um and that has many stories about these particular mermaids from in different kinds of indigenous folklore in canada next up we have mommy wata she's seen in many different ways sometimes it's many creatures or it's just one woman um but usually it's seen as a woman but sometimes a man um some bring people to underwater lair and grant spiritual enlightenment she can haunt dreams especially from those who steal from her um she can inflict ailments and in south african folklore specifically she can fly in a tornado um it kind of reminds me kind of like anansi from my very very first episode spider gods she takes on different roles especially as her stories were traveled by oral tradition during slavery so she's mostly seen in west central and southern africa and she's said to have the head and torso of a woman and sometimes a man of course and the tail of a fish or snake next up we have jengu which is from cameroon this is um a water spirit um these water spirits are messengers between humans and gods Also, since I'm apparently not shutting up about my sequel today, (laughs) um, my entire sequel is told from the point of view of a messenger, not of a Jengu. It's uh, not of a Jengu or like a water type creature. It's a tree creature. That's a super secret. Now, you know, Um, but I just think it's interesting that there are these like messengers between gods and humans. I really like that concept. And that's basically what my second book is kind of all about if I'm really like encapsulating it but they're said to be beautiful with fish tails and long wild hair um they're said to be healers and sometimes there are roots in the Mamiwata stories next up what we have Rusalka um I learned later uh that Rusalka is the plural form um but i don't know the singular form of this type of creature so this is from slavic eurasia and they live in lakes and ponds and they often try to drown quote handsome young men end quote what i find interesting is that they try and drown handsome young men but some of the rusalka are men uh, or are mask looking So I think that's interesting, or maybe that is inaccurate or not common. Maybe more commonly, they're they're more femme. Sometimes the Rusalka are seen as fertility goddesses. Some even say that they're the spirits of women who drown themselves to escape abusive marriages. And sometimes they're depicted as tickling their victims to get to death. There's definitely a theme of taking back power or vindictiveness that keeps showing up with these stories and these depictions, especially when talking about the torture of tickling. Like, I know it sounds like kind of silly, but tickling can be really abusive. Like, there needs to be consent. You need to be able to stop. You need to listen to the person because the person can't help but laugh. It's a, a body reaction to tickling. And um, I don't know. There's just like, especially with like, drowning themselves to escape an abusive marriage and then turning around and tickling someone to death I just think that there's like that weird depiction of like cycle like abuse cycle and then vindictiveness afterward or trying to get your power back but also it might not be that deep and I could be just pontificating uh, about something I'm not sure if there's roots to that these rusalka are seen as young and beautiful with of course you guessed it long hair um from from what i read sometimes the hair aids in the drowning of these men like sometimes it's like sentient almost like tentacles like it doesn't look like tentacles it looks like hair but it has its own like helpfulness to their plan of drowning next up we have vodianoi 
these are Slavic Eurasian creatures and they make me uncomfortable. Um, mm. They are these naked, algae-covered old men with fish faces. Um, the pictures I saw sometimes look a little froggy-faced, too. And I'm like, I love frogs so much, and they're so cute. And you put them on top of these algae-covered old men. Um, and it makes me so sad <laughs> and uncomfortable. Um, but they drown... Or this this is a little nuts. So they capture people fishing, like the, but specifically it said anglers, which I didn't know what that meant. But that means like the fishing rod, um, and line and hook at the end, like the whenever I at least for me whenever I think of traditional fishing, like I'm going fishing, that's what I think of. But they they will capture people fishing, and sometimes force them into slavery in their underwater layers. I'm like, what happened to you? Sometimes they will store the humans' souls in teapots. Like, where did you get a teapot in this, I'm assuming, lake or ocean that you're living in? Actually, you know what? I'm, I keep forgetting that mud larking is a thing. They probably definitely have teapots down in there. More room to sto- store human souls, I guess. Um, but to appease them... Um, and try and avoid being kidnapped, you're supposed to put a pinch of tobacco in the water as like an offering or a sign of goodwill and like, hey, don't don't target me. Next up, we have Mudjawang and that they're from Australia. Um, This reminds me of La Llorona. And if you're curious about that creepy tale, then you can check out the second episode. It's called Mother Goat Sucker. (laughs) Um, Because I cover La Llorona and... um, El Chupacabra um, in that one Uh, and it would be like a fun throwback if you haven't listened to it yet from episode two but the Moldjewonk lurk in the seaweed in the Murray River of South Australia Uh, they are from aboriginal folk tales um, and it was often used by parents just like La Llorona with me um, to warn children not to play too close to the river especially at night or the Moljawang will eat them. Next up, we have a Daro from the Solomon Islands. These are malevolent merfolk. Um, they're pretty badass, though. Uh, so they they will shoot at humans with flying fish. <laughs> I love it. It's like, listen, they're they're already basically projectiles. Like we've got to just shoot them down with the flying fish um they also have a shark dorsal fin which is interesting because they're the first time i've seen um like i i shouldn't say seen first time i've read because i've seen tons of different artworks with like a shark type merfolk or something um with the dorsal fin or that kind of body shape but it's just interesting that these are on paper like in black and white said to have a dorsal fin like a shark Um, they also have tail fins for feet Um, and then they have gills behind their human ears which i think is interesting next up we have the river mama this one was familiar to me and then when i saw where they were from then it made sense uh they're from jamaican folklore i was like oh that's why (laughs) that's why river mama sound familiar Um, You probably already know this, but I'm mixed race, first generation Caribbean American. um, And my granddad specifically was from Jamaica, um, straight from Kingston. But the river mama was said to be a river maiden and a mother to all fish and like undersea, like the river life as well, but specifically fish. Um, I mean, she's mother to all of them, but like her specialty was fish. Um, During the full moon, you could spot her as she sits on a boulder and combs through her hair with a golden comb. And she often appears with very long locks um, or dreadlocks in case you didn't know. Like, you know, I've noticed that a lot of like um, non-black folks don't don't know that locks is short for dreadlocks. Um, I've heard a lot of people call them dreads, even though that's not usually the typical term. That's just my fun fact for you um in case you didn't already know and if you did already know i'm so sorry i over explained that (laughs) um so she has these long locks uh the torso and head of a beautiful woman 
and a fishtail. Also, I wanted to make a point to say when I say beautiful woman, first of all, I'm going to get more into what beauty means, like and how that can be interpreted um, later. But it, each of these beautiful maidens that you've been hearing about or handsome young men are all from the beauty standards of whatever country we're talking about. So the river mama is going to be a beautiful Jamaican woman. The Rusalka are going to be beautiful Eurasian women and so on and so forth. And I'm just saying that so that your brain can start taking in even more information about how diverse these merfolk can be. Um, Because these have been stories that are, I've learned thousands and thousands of years old. I had no idea that mermaid lore went back that far, but um, it's just like they've taken on so many forms and shapes. I just think it's like important to like really let your imagination run wild, especially with the Oceanids. (laughs) Be horrified with me. So here's where I'm feeling kind of torn in two different directions. On the one hand, this is enough for my typical deep dives that I would do and my typical special episodes. They're usually like a little under an hour to a little over an hour. My longest one being like an hour and 20 minutes or an hour and a half or something like that. However, I have so much more to go through. Um, I've covered all the different I mean, not all, clearly. I mean, there's so many different stories and subgenres and sub symbol and symbolism depending on what country or region we're talking about. There are so many more, but I went over kind of like the general foundation of many, many different ways that merfolk can show up. And so I think that what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of stop here. Um, and make this part one of this mermaid mermaid um, special episode. And, you know, then in the future, I can talk specifically like on the next one, which won't come out next week, because next week is Beltane. And I really wanted to talk to you about Beltane. But then the next week after that, I'll release part two. And that I'll go over the myths and then the like themes and symbolism and symbolism meaning like the femme fatale, the bared breasts, the long hair, the quote beauty and like what does that even mean? The holding hostage, domesticate versus feral woman, which totally shows up in the myths that I'll go over next time. Um, And also like what like what fertility means and how people have struggled with that. Um, over the years and it was nice to have hope in something else to help with fertility because I know that can be a really um, a big pain point for people that want to have babies Um, and then also like feminine power like it's pretty incredible what has shown up all through the years like where the mermaid is this symbol of like beauty, feminine power, and being like a feral person. I think it's very cool. So I'll get more into that. um, And like the stories and then the themes and symbolism and my kind of like my conclusion at the end of it. um, Next episode. So thank you for letting me make this a very, very special deep dive episode into mermaids. Thank you for letting me like lab about this with you. I hope that you're like intrigued and kind of horrified with me. And I will see you next week with a little break from the mermaid talk because I feel like I've done nothing but mermaids forever. Um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Keep on swimming and I will see you next week. Thanks to all you spooky souls out there for listening to Creepy Core and Folklore. Follow on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok if you're looking for more uncanny content. If you have your own tales to tell, you can email creepycoreandfolklore at gmail.com. If you liked this, please leave a review wherever you get your podcasts or tell a friend who might enjoy these stories to spread the word. 
If you're interested in dark fantasy, check out my Hollowverse series. Ashes is available now in paperback and ebook on Amazon and audiobook on Audible. And the sequel is underway. I'm Iona Wayland, and I'll see you next time.